everybody. Welcome to Sound Bombing. I created this show for people who want to experience a radical, life-changing journey through the sounds of my diverse guests. I hope that each sound you hear on this show will strengthen your faith, encourage your dreams, and challenge you to awaken the greatness within you. Drop the bomb. Drop the bomb. We're going to drop the bomb. This is a journey into sound. A journey which along the way will bring to you new color, new dimension, new values, and a new experience. Good evening, good afternoon, good day, whatever time of the day it is. It's always a good time to be here with me in the Sound Bombing Studios. Again, I'm your host, Dr. Lamar Darnell Shields. Always excited that you are here listening to me because you can be anywhere, but you decide to hang out with me today. And as the old gospel song says, I count it all joy. I'm excited that you are here because there's so many other shows that you could be listening to. And I know you're not here because I got this fly shirt on. I know you're not here because you like my voice. I think that you're here because you heard I've had some of the most amazing guests on the show, and today is no different. But before we bring our guest up, last week, if you are following, if you're following the order of the shows, my friend Jennifer Moore, this lady laid it down, talking about breath work, spirituality, talking about being in tune and being in balance, and talking about the things that we need to do to take care of ourselves during this COVID pandemic. And I learned so much. It was something interesting about Jennifer. And I bring so many people on this show, but we had an immediate connection. And I really, really appreciate her and the conversation. So I'm, I'm telling you, if you missed that show, you need to go back and check it out. So for my old heads that are here, you all know what time it is. We're about to do our three breaths. For my newbies in the building, welcome. Thanks for joining us. We are about to do what we call our three breaths. We set the foundation here because we like to clear the space and clear the energy because you don't know what type of energy I'm bringing. And I don't know what type of energy that you bring. Well, you know I'm bringing. I'm always going to bring some good vibes. So I want my guests who are here, I want you to just sit up, sit straight, put your hands on your lap. We're going to do our three breaths, palms facing up. This is like one of my favorite parts of the show because it allows me to come down. I've been talking all day. And so this is a great opportunity for me just to bring my energy down and then sort of raise my vibration. So all, your eyes are closed like my third graders used to say to me, Javier and Christina, they would say, Senor Shields, sit up, sit back and roll your shoulders back and relax. And here we go. Everything is soft and your face is soft. And just want to focus on your breath. We're going to do a scan of our body. Okay. We're going to take our three breaths. Our first breath, inhale. We're going to hold it for three seconds and then exhale. We're going to do it two more times. Inhale, going a little deeper. Hold it for three seconds. Exhale. The last one is much, much deeper. We're going to go deeper. Inhale. Hold it for five seconds. Exhale. And sound bombers, what do we call that? We call that the breath of life. And we always start with that because we want to make sure that our energy is high and make sure that we're feeling great because we know that there's a mm -hmm. pandemic out there. We want to just send our prayers and love to all those folks who are in the midst of doing this work in the pandemic, those doctors, those EMT, and those great teachers that are out there. So let's get it down. Let's get it started. Sound bombers. I'm always asking the question. This is interesting. Why do some relationships look so promising yet dissolve over time? Woo! Million dollar question. <laughs> and why do others whose partners seem hopelessly mismatched grow stronger? Mm -hmm. Well, much research has tried to identify the individual characteristics that makes for a successful relationship. I always tell people, if you can run a, keep a sexful, sexual relationship together, successful, I said sexual, that too, successful relationship <laughs> together, you can run a Fortune $500 company mm -hmm. because all shed some light on what may be the underlying relationship success. It's not how well two prospective partners matched up on a dating site. It's not about personality features, personality history, or interest. Those are some things. 
These do play a role in predicting long-term relationship success. But a recent study, you know, I'm an educator, so I'm always talking about a study, but a recent study found they play a much smaller role than some people may think. Mm -hmm. The studies from Canada's Western University was based on information from 43 studies of 11,000 couples and found that the strongest predictor is the kind of relationship the partners create together over time. Mm -hmm. That's it. The quality of relationships they experience transcend individual traits or characteristics in predicting the couple's happiness over time. As a lead author, Samantha Joel stated, it suggests that the person who chooses not nearly as important as the relation we build, it's overall way that the partners relate to each other. Mm -hmm. The research shows it and adds that the dynamic that you build with someone, shared norms, then inside jokes and shared experiences is much more powerful. So our two guests know more about this than I do, because look at them, <laughs> they look so happy. Christine and Javier, they're gonna share with us the true art of relationship, their story of really practicing what it takes to maintain and build a relationship. They are authors and a married couple. Javier and Christina share their lessons learned from a life of experience and expertise, facilitating over 1,000 individuals preparing for marriage in their new book, lest I said a new book, so you're going to pick it up, Boundless Love, Healing Your Marriage Before It Begins. In their non-profit ministry, they support other couples by sharing the life-changing lessons they learn after almost ending their marriage after the second time. Faith-based public speakers, facilitators, and writers, Javier and Christina's mission is to keep people together and bring faith <laughs> into every relationship. And they decided to join me, little old me, and all the thousand out there in the bomb shelter. Javier, Christina, bienvenidos. Welcome to Sound Bombing. How are you? <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Lamar. You are a bright light, for yes, sure. Yes, yes. Right. Thank so you, you for the... You all are bright like with that hot pink light behind you. That's it. That's <laughs> or it. that is just the beautiful energy that you all actually have. So let our listeners, listeners know where you're calling in from and how are you doing since this insane pandemic has taken place Woo! all over? Well, we're calling in from the Bay Area. So we're just south of San Francisco, California. Mm -hmm. And um, we're doing it day by day. I think we were very blessed because um, we have our children. We have two daughters, 13 and 10. They just started school yesterday, virtual school. Well, there's a classroom here and there's a classroom there. And, you know, we just have our faith behind us. That is what we count on. That is what we're focused on because if you take another look, it could look like the apocalypse. Right now mm -hmm. we have tons of fires um we have friends being evacuated right now so we're in a lot of prayer um just being very very grateful of our own safety let alone sanity minute by minute basically lamar minute by minute, minute. By minute. javier what about you bro i i think we've been blessed uh we everything that we most of the work that we do uh, in our nonprofit ministry is on site and mm -hmm. we decided to really evolve and bring the same experiences virtually. And I think we God is with us. Mm -hmm. We have accomplished that. We are, I think we have prepared over a hundred couples this year mm -hmm. for, for marriage. And we're reaching out doing virtual workshops and, and really creating conversations and, and really also gaining wisdom from other couples that are going through this uh, strange and weird times. Well, you all could not have shown up at a more perfect time because <laughs> COVID is like somebody's drunk uncle that they want to hide in the closet and don't want this dude to come out. We're going to call him Tio Juan. That's out to my brother. <laughs> Tio Juan. <laughs> Juan. We're going to, we don't, that, because, the, you know, in all seriousness, we know that couples are struggling. We, we're yes. talking about mm -hmm. health issues. We're talking about other things. But one of the things that I've been really concerned about as I've been doing the show, and I'm so grateful and honored that you all decided to hang out with me. My partner and best friend is in California. She dealt with a hailstorm yesterday. Mm. Like everything that you said is taking place. And so we need to talk about couples. We need to talk about love and relationships. But we know that there's been an increase of not only just divorce or relationships breaking up, 
but also abuse going on. Could you imagine right now being stuck in your home, mm -hmm. somebody that you don't, that you want to find missing on a milk carton because this person That's right. is insane. And, but yeah. then all seriousness aside, there's a lot of abuse and we don't want to, we don't, we don't want to make, make joke of that because we know it is real. And so your, the timing for you to be on here is important because most of the people uh, that I brought on to talk about spirit and spirituality and about breath work and a variety of different things, this show is created to really help people elevate what's going on around them. I call you all superheroes and sheroes who have some great roadmaps and some great strategies. And I had another couple on here. They did a, they do a thing called Love Across America. They travel all over the country. And they remind you all, remind me of you guys. They just, the love that I saw with them and, and their relationship. And they, they were very transparent talking about the challenges. So, but Christina, you talked about a word that jumped out at me. And it's a word that I really, really believe in. You talked about faith, you know, having faith. Mm -hmm. during times. Mm -hmm. So let's unpack that word, you know, for our listeners. What does that really mean to you? And, and is it more valuable right now in this pandemic than maybe we, we've seen in our lifetimes? Oh, absolutely. I feel like we are in, you know, a huge turning point as a species. And I feel spiritually we are being beyond invited, almost demanded to rise up in our faith and really kind of put the pedal to the metal, you know, rubber meets the road mm. and make it real, right? Implement what you believe. And so um, I, I, there was a neighbor, I would go on a morning walk run and she had a shirt this morning that said, hope is not canceled, right? And I love that, right? I really believe that for us, if we did not have any faith as our foundation, our marriage would have fallen apart and our sanity, right? Our mental health would be even further apart because um, we're not perfect. We have many flaws. We are just open about them because we don't want other people to suffer needlessly, right? And I think faith is around not just believing in a higher power, but knowing that there's a divine design and purpose to your soul and to your life. And that there's meaning to all of this suffering. We may not always know why it's happening, but that doesn't, that's no reflection on, you know, our creator who is blessing us. We are just living through it right now to get the lessons that we need to get. And it's very humbling. It can be very humiliating, but for us, COVID-19 has been about learning how to gracefully suffer and surrender. I like that. That is, stuff. yeah, that is where it's at because Javi and I just were saying, you know, you have to breathe into not having control, right? And get comfortable with not knowing because we're all on this huge eclipse of time where we're, we just aren't going to know what anything's going to yeah. look like for a while. Absolutely. Javier, how, what, do you, what are some strategies that you, that you have that you've sort of pulled out your toolkit when your faith was tested? Let's just say in your marriage or just personally in, in, uh, in other endeavors in your life? Yeah, definitely. I think one of them, and I think this is very hard for men to do, is to surrender. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a very hard time surrendering to the situation because we as men, we, we want to be providers, right? We want to provide everything from a financial aspect, you know, love, everything, support. And we need to surrender as, as men and have that faith. And I wake up every day, I say, I, I don't have the answers, but I, I know who's guiding me to get there. I just need to have faith and surrender that there's things I cannot control. Um, so that's, that's my strategy. And, and really looking inward, and I was telling Christina just today, we're, I said, you know, one of my goals by the end of the year is to do major cleaning in my life. And what I mean by that is what is serving me? to serve my higher power and what is not serving me anymore. I have to just make peace with it, appreciate it, and move on. So I think this time is also to reflect and say what is what is giving me the strength and what is taking me, what is taking energy out of me that I need to make peace with and move on. Yeah, and I I love that man. I love making peace right now is so so important. In, 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 my walk, in my walk and in my life and the work that I do and making peace with the work that I'm doing with my children, my family. Mm. I think that that's important. And you bring up a good point as men, you know, some of the things that we struggle because society 
sort of put these labels, you know, none of us, none of, you know, all of us are set up almost like to fail because all of these labels have been put on us. The women, the woman is yeah. supposed to do this, the man is supposed to do the thing. And we know now these roles are shifting and there's a lot of confusion. Like, well, I thought I was supposed to be shopping. Well, I thought I was supposed to be cooking. Well, I thought I was supposed to be feeding the baby. I thought, I'll... and so there's a lot of confusion. And then you sort of see those breakdowns. And I know in the research that was given to me from my producers, I know that no one enters into a marriage expecting it to, and nobody does. So when you all found yourself at, the, at your own crossroads doing this work now, because think about this, you're in the trenches. You're yeah. doing yeah. the work. What were your feelings towards one another? And then how did, how did you shift? What were some of the things that you had to put in place in order to shift where you all were going? Well, I think that um, we, we both are doers. So we were automatic drivers. And so what happened was when we hit bottom in our relationship, we just um, mobilized in the wrong direction, right? Like we were mobilizing to separate essentially. And Javi was very courageous at that period because he essentially, at that time he was traveling internationally 50%, if not more. So we had a lot, we had forced separation, which actually was a blessing because it gave us space, right? To breathe and to think through and, and to reflect. And he asked a pivotal question um, during that time. And, and it was like all BS aside, right? You know, in getting beyond sort of the tit for tat, you know, he said, she, you said that kind of thing. He asked me, do you still love me? Period. And I knew immediately my answer was yes. And I'm not saying that's enough for everyone. I'm not saying that's like the golden ticket. But for us, it was this epiphany of we need to recommit then. It was like almost like a rebirth of our relationship and kind of starting from, right, a ground zero, mm -hmm. internally doing individual therapy, couples therapy, going to our pastors individually, collectively, um, surrounding ourselves with other couples in our ministry who we looked up to and basically saying, this is bigger than us. We need support. You need to guide us and releasing shame around having conflict. And that was really huge because I think in our society, a lot of married couples feel like they have to front or put on whatever this image of perfection or we're together. We got this when in reality um, it's not that easy. So I, I want to I want to jump in right there real quick because I, I think about this as you as you're talking, Christina. So you get married, Christina. You have all your ladies up there. Let's just say sometimes y'all go deep, like 25 ladies. <laughs> then we got to match your size. So you got the ladies over here, and you got the men on this side, and you come together for this marriage. And you know it's this whole all oh, the dresses, the suits, the shoes, all of that other stuff. Right. And everybody's, you know, catering to your knees and, and, and they're still so excited. And Javier, we looking at Javier like, man, you sure you want to do this, man? You sure? It's interesting how we see the world. But you got that one dude like, man, yes, Javier, you deserve her. And that other dude like, man, listen, we could, we could be bachelors forever. So you think about the people that come to your space. But I want you all to think about this because this is what I don't think people really, 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 really unpack quite a bit. You have them up there doing this amazing time and they're supporting you. But when things hit rock bottom, mm -hmm. we never call those people. I believe in this village, you know, you mm -hmm. know, we have some connected roots based on what, what I know about you. And I believe that this, this village effect where you have these people come in and they're there to support you. But then when things happen, Christina, Javier, we don't typically call those individuals into our space. Mm -hmm. Like when we were getting married, we brought them into wedding rehearsals. We brought them into right. bridal showers. Yeah. We brought them into everything. But when we hit rock bottom, what message do you have for those couples that when we're talking about you standing at this altar, wherever you are, and you're bringing these people, why don't we then reach out to them and say, hey, this is, this is not what I signed up for. I need some support. <laughs> I, I, the, I, I, well, we, well, we, we publish a book, so we share everything. Yeah. Um, we, we always, we, I mean, we meet so many couples and we always, always ask them, Hey, how many people are you inviting for your wedding? 
and we mm -hmm. have we have seen i mean we have her from 600 all the way oh, yeah. to 100 and so on oh, and i goodness. i asked them i said what is your uh filtering for inviting people and they're like well some are relatives some my mom say this my mm -hmm. dad says that i'm like okay great and i go let me ask you a question um what will happen if something bad happened to you? You think all those 400 or 300 people are going to reach out and support you? Oh, most likely one. So they asked me, well, what do you, what do you do in your wedding? So <clears throat> for us, we had a method, which I don't suggest anybody to do it, but it worked <laughs> for us. We, I told Christina, I go, we're going to follow some steps. Javi's hardcore. We're going to follow some. Hardcore. We're going to follow some steps. Let's put the list together. So we put the list together and I think we came out. I don't know, 200 something. Yeah, something like that. And I say, okay, out of those 200 people, how many people have we received Christmas cards? Okay, well, that reduced the list from 250 to 170. Okay, great. Out of those 170 people, how many times have we got together with them and break bread with them? Well, that reduced it to another 70 off. Okay, out of those 100 people that we already filtered down, how do we feel when we spend time with them afterwards? Mm -hmm. When we are driving back home, how do we feel? Do we go, oh my God, they're so great. You know, we had a great conversation. There's, they fill us up. Or do we feel like, can you believe he said that? Can you believe she said that? <laughs> so we filter even further. And we came back, we came with 68 individuals. My venue, where I got, I got married in the church, by the reception, their venue was a villa where it can accommodate close to 2,000 people, and we had 68 people on the patio, so I had a lot of space. But uh, until now, until this you day, a, you I think... COVID wedding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of social yeah, distancing. Ahead. Ahead of time. But until this day, I think out of those 68, we're still in touch with 60 people. Yeah, and just know there's still fallout, even from that, right? right? And I think that's what you're speaking to, Lamar, is that you really want to cultivate this awareness when you're going into your marriage that it's not just about the two of you. You know, in, in the Catholic Church where we were married, the, the sacrament is ministered to one another by one another. The priest mm -hmm. is a witness. You are giving it to one another. And so in that community, there are bystanders and they're agreeing to support your marriage, right? So I think... You know, obviously there's fallout and, you know, there are things in life that go well beyond and above our control. But I think you're bringing up a really true point is that how willing are we to be vulnerable, right, about the things that matter? And our marriage and our closest relationship, even I, in the beginning of COVID, we were saying, look, we need to talk about this because this is like hardcore proximity. Like our whole family you know, is an 1800 square feet. We're like got four videos going at all time. How are we going to get through this? But I think that you're right. You want to be able to have some awareness going into your marriage about who do you actually trust and can you let down the mass? Can mm -hmm. you let it down? Exactly. Yeah. And I think that that's important when you're talking about having people stand up there in front of the God that you believe in, in front of the mm -hmm. faith, in front of the community and then share these and then not be able to reach out to them. Uh, I, th I think it, I think it's, uh, um, I think, it, I, I think we should spend more time really reflecting on that. One of the things I love about my, my, my daughters, uh, they're two different ages. One is a, one is a college, the other one is in high school. And my oldest daughter is an artist, but they both are artists. One is a singer, one is an actor. And so with my oldest daughter, when she has an event, she wants a whole bunch of people there. My youngest daughter is about, you could be, she's very specific on this person, mm -hmm. that person, that person, and she's really into quality. And I think, I think your formula, you know, all jokes aside, Javi, I think it's a great formula. And it leads me to my next question then. Well, what is one of the, what is one of the uh, ways that couples can prepare for marriage or know that they are in their quote unquote right relationship? Because that's a, that's a preparation, the mm -hmm. wedding, the big thing. But what are some things should they, should, should we be doing, looking for as we're choosing a mate? Uh, as, as we're choosing someone that we expect to live together with, uh, what are some of those things we should start looking for? So I think the first, one of the biggest things, you know, for us was in terms of values and faith. So if that, you know, you really need to know what your non-negotiables are and what you want to base your relationship mm -hmm. on. So 
for us, I think that was really clear that through our own past individually, I mean, we're from very different backgrounds. We're a bicultural marriage. We have, um, we do have a similar faith background, but we're both kind of rebels in our families with our faith. We're, and so if that got attracted, but the point being. That's what made him sexy, huh? You that's remember. right. Of course. I have my own Javier Bardem He's right here. But Thank you. Yes. But the point being is, you know, that core belief system is what's going to surpass anything. So, you know, when you're raising children, if you choose to have them, Javi and I have the same values about how we, how our, we want our daughters to dress, for example, or how we want our educational goals for our children, for example. Um, what, how, how we want to celebrate holidays or how much work is a priority over family, those kind of things. So you need to know yourself enough to know your values to then be able to attract and seek that. I think the problem is, is when we, and this is a, a definitely, I think females, you know, as women were socialized so much around, well, I need to be sought or I need to be, um, a, a man needs to show that he's attracted to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I need to prove that I'm beautiful and worthy of this male gaze and attention. But in reality, that's kind of right, externalizing the truth. Like the truth is really internally and he, who you want to attract is really valuing what's on the inside. And I think that, you know, is a key piece from my side of what you want to go in with. But I'm sure you have a different opinion. Uh, yeah, I, I, because my, I think my opinion goes towards the, the men. I always ask men uh, when, they're, when they come for our retreats is, what are the strengths that you see in your significant, the person that you're going to marry to? And some men kind of go, well, and they start thinking, uh, well, I want her to be this way. And I'm thinking, no, 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 no. What are their strengths? What are the gifts that you see mm. on your lady? And they start thinking and they're like, God, I never thought about it. I say, well, that's what you got to look for. Because if you look into the beauty of someone, that means you want more of that beauty. You want more of that strength mm -hmm. to flourish and keep growing. But if you want that person to cook you dinner, to, you know, tell you to, not to check the credit card balance once in a while, not to tell you to buy that car on a lease, to do mm -hmm. things like that, then sure, there's, people, there's women that are very uh, submissive and they're willing to do that. But you're not looking into the beauty and the strengths of, of an individual that you're going to help them and support them to flourish. So when I look at Christina, I'm like, she's a gold mine. I look at, I, I, from the longest times I keep saying, you got to write a book. You're amazing. You're such a great writer. You're such a great speaker. I got to, you know, and I always wanted her to flourish. And I always told myself, if I have to sacrifice, I will do it because just the fact that she is growing as an individual, bringing peace and love to my heart. Mm -hmm. Is there a moment in life where you all felt like you sacrificed to be one? Has that ever has that ever happened? <laughs> I was gonna say, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, and, and then, <laughs> because Christina, you talked about values, I want to switch the values up, and and I want to add culture in there because mm. looking at you all, you all have a different cultural <laughs> dynamic. When and at what point in your marriage did that culture just clash? Oh, <laughs> it's quite, we've gone through many phases, right? It's like, and it's a constant, but I think it hit us hard. Mm -hmm. Um, and wow, it's wow. Cause we haven't talked about this in a long time. You know, <laughs> it dates us because it was many years ago, but the first phase was really tough because it was a lot around the wedding. Right. And just our families in the same space inhabiting the same space. My, you know, I'm from a suburb of Detroit, Michigan, lily white, very segregated. I'm a social worker, so I'm the rebel, right? Like, yeah, I that's fled it. You're a immediately. Worker. Yeah, that, there we go. Okay, I, so <laughs> I immediately fled that environment, but I was from a very, very, um, you know, just Americana, white, um, middle class, you know, in... And both my mom is first generation Eastern European American, but my dad is Chicago, like you know, hey, German hey, Catholic. You, yeah, city. yeah, you I, get I, it. It's I, all, I probably yeah. sat next to him in church one day. Oh, I'm sure you did. <laughs> and I love you, Dad. 
Um, but in any case, there, you know, so I was definitely rebellious, but I don't, I didn't realize in my own, I think, cultural ignorance how, you know, I didn't really, I wasn't on the same page as my family and my family members were acting in certain ways. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't identify with their belief system. So it was like, whatever. And then I'm like, wait, I need to help control this. You know what I mean? Like, this cannot just be. Um, left alone. So Javi was just blown away, I think, initially of like, wait, what are they doing? Like, how are they <laughs> acting that way? Like, why is that happening? And and my family's much more repressed, like quiet, like passive aggressive. Um, you know, it's just uh, it's very denial. It's very like white Midwestern culture, like, you know. Just so very- as, you, as you're saying that, Christina, how, how are you feeling? Like, when, as you're articulating that and you're because you're being very transparent. I really appreciate you. And I, yeah. and I, and I, cause I want people to start working with you all, because if you could be this transparent about yourself and Javi is laughing because the reality is we come from two different worlds. Yes. We from, we, you can be, a, you can yes. be, a white, you can be a white woman from the suburbs of Detroit and he can be a white guy from the city of Detroit. That's and right. That's two, and that's two totally. different. Yeah, different absolutely. Things. And so, so how does it feel when you're saying those things? I, I personally, I, my belief system is that I think, I feel empowered by telling the yeah. truth. You know what I'm it. saying? Like for me, my whole life was like, why don't, why aren't there black people in my neighborhood? Like, why are there black people at church and not in my neighborhood? Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? So, even as a child, I thought this is very strange, right? And um, so that's just my experience of the world, and I feel relieved. I mean, I'm a community college professor. Um, pretty much in every profession, if you want to just talk race, I've been a minority of all my, t- you know, that's where I feel like I would just rather have it out and own the privilege and speak truthfully about it and the responsibility that comes with it. And you and add I, value. You, you add value. Mm-hmm. What's Go that? Ahead. I said you add value to conversations that's right. that many people aren't privy to. Um, because my partner, who I work with in California, white female, um, you know, grew up in Palm Springs, pretty well off, but all of her work is just very centered like yours, mainly work with black and Latinos, uh, you know, black and brown people, uh, just thinks different from the majority of the people. And so she's the one at the dinners and there, her, there's, there's like the Benetton commercial at our house. Yeah, that's still, our family. That's, that's our family. family. But still, there's a group of people that still say some, oh, yeah. say some slick stuff on the side that then that you have to remind them of that. But what were you going to say? Because what were you, you going to say something else? Just no, about, just sort of. the very first day that Javi and we had a, we were met, we met via two group uh, friends. So mm-hmm. my good friend from a colleague from work, she's Filipina, Bi- bicultural. bicultural as well. <laughs> she's Filipina <laughs> and he is um, gu- from Guatemala and he was Javi's first American friend when he came from Spain. So anyhow, Luis and Sheila, and they got us together and introduced us at their home for dinner. And while Javi and I are getting into our, you know, banter and we're talking and kind of ch- checking each other out, he says to me, well, I just need you to know that I don't trust gringas, especially white, blonde gringas. And I said, well, first day. I, yeah, for, this was within an hour. Straight up. Yeah, straight up. <laughs> and I just looked at him and I said, that is not my issue. Mm. That's not my issue. That's right. So if you want to get to know me, fine but that is your issue and of and course like it, <laughs> that's right finger snap again, yeah like in the and, background. I, and I, that's all you know that's a very aloof kind of like yeah. you know sassy response i mean i i do obviously think it is partially my issue but the point i wanted to say to him is you're not gonna like one up me like you know what i'm saying like i still need to hold you accountable too if we're gonna actually mm-hmm. ever have any kind of even friendship right so in any case, I think the bicultural to answer your you know question was a lot of just de- really leveling our expectations, because Javi's family is you know from Spain, super like loud confrontation. I mean, if it's not just an argument, I know like all about that. <laughs> oh no, they like they will shut a restaurant down. They will like if there's an argument with his siblings, it's like I just, the please don't hit anyone with the plates. Like it's on right. And so, and our daughters are very passionate too, but whatever. So the point is, is you have two different mm-hmm. approaches. Yeah. 
And Javi's like, what's wrong with your family? Like, why? It, they're, and he's like, they're not having a good time. And I'm like, no, that's them. <laughs> that is them. Yeah. But it took us a long time to get through. Yeah, it took it us. It really a, did. That remind me of a story. I Back in the days when Netflix had DVDs, um, <laughs> I, I went to visit my in-laws. And, oh, and, geez. and I happened to grab the, so wrong, the wrong DVD. And the wrong DVD, we were going to watch something. And I put the wrong DVD. And the wrong DVD was a, a documentary uh, uh, of George Lopez talking about where is what is America and mm -hmm. and why we stand for and that's why the reason why the, the Latino the experience Latino, and, of America. and that's why I love America I, I mm -hmm. this is my country um, and I, I love I'm it. more critical of I, I love I love the United States because what we have nobody has in terms of diversity and and the culture and everything and I'm I after we were watching it, he was kind of like, well, mm. this guy George Lopez, and I said, well, listen, this is it, this is what it is, and we have to embrace it. And your granddaughters have that, and that's the mm. new America. And if you don't embrace that, then we're gonna have a problem. And now that I'm reflecting, because my family, my dad was very prejudiced. My dad said, you gotta marry your kind, you gotta marry your own religion. And my brother, none of that happened. None of that happened. My 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 sister married a Dominican Republic, Republican. My my dad, my brother married uh, Japanese. So when we go out, we are the Benetton uh, family. The <laughs> thing where the the thing that we foster foster kids. Are, <laughs> and uh, my, I I'm so fortunate to, my daughters and my family. They're colorblind. We don't. We have we have cry of what we have seen so far, not just this year, but when I came here in '84, um, I, I've been called spig, wet back, back to your country. I've been called Mexican and my swimming and water polo team. So I went through that, and and that made us stronger together because we we like mm. we gotta we gotta let go of that hate and that ignorance, and we gotta we gotta come out and walk strong of who we are as a family. And I think I'm so fortunate to have everybody in my family that we don't, for us, race is not an issue. It's more of, we look at people and say, what's wrong with them? I mean, really seriously? I mean, we are walking backwards, right? And and I, I do hope that people start thinking that way, that, that we need to come together because together is what's mm. gonna give us what we need, not not looking at differences. Or and feeling I, guilty and making it up, right? And, oh, indeed. Believe me, I know. I, my stories are very similar to you all. And, and I think when you all are describing this word, it sounds like to me what you all phrase this boundless love mm -hmm. that yeah. you talk about. Can you unpack, because that's what I'm feeling, can you unpack that concept of boundless love? What does that actually mean? I think what we experienced when we had our breakdown to breakthrough moment, mm -hmm. that pivotal catharsis crisis in our marriage was that you know there were so many layers that needed healing it was our individual you know childhoods mm -hmm. um our families of origin as well as our differences bicultural and otherwise and um and also gender differences right in terms of just how we view the world and really diving into all that and so i think we feel that our faith is what created that bigger paradigm for us, that bigger, it's almost like a stratosphere. And it feels like our love is bigger than us, right? That it, our union and the way that we can heal each other and ourselves through our marriage is in that faith, which feels balanced, feels way bigger than us. And we also feel that without our faith, we would not have survived it, you know, so point blank. So faith is one of the things is one of the things is the glue between the two of y'all yes. that really really make because you know when you talk about faith you also have to have faith in your family and I know you all talked about your family when you do get married I don't think what people realize you marrying an entire family you're mm -hmm. marrying ancestors that you don't even know like they, that's right um, that's right you, things, true. Will, things will come that up is true. because you can look at a picture of a kid let's just say Javier there's a photo of that your daughter think it's you and you like, no, that's your grandfather. Like, no, that's your, and you've never met this guy, but your mother said, no, that's your uncle. 
and it's a part of who you are. And I think we forget that not only do we have those people that are up there with us that are getting married with us, but then we also have those families that you just said. I was just watching the movie Pizzoli. I don't know if you saw this movie. The woman is actually out of California. It's a great film about a Mexican dish. It is, it is a funny film about Latin culture mm -hmm. and how how this young lady became a vegetarian. Now, you probably know Javier being a vegetarian and being a Latino, you know, <laughs> sometimes that don't go well. And so the whole story is about her shift and her change and nobody really accepted it. But the beautiful part about this film, Bazzoli, is this, this uh, it's a dish is that she she was hiding a part of who she was. Yeah. She was she was in denial and her abuelita, as she talked about, was this wise woman who never went to college but was wiser than anybody else. And because she had intellectually grown up, she tended to neglect her family. And what I'm loving about you all, you said, even though our family is doing this, they're part of who we are, they're my children, they're part of my, and that's what I think, sort of that concept of that balanced love uh, that you're sharing, I think is very, very important because people need to know that those families. Now I wanna talk about some of the people that you work with. Now I want you, cause we having a good time. I'm sure there's some couples that you just said, listen, ain't no miracle in the world gonna work. <laughs> you don't have to say their names. Like Javier, you don't have to say their names, but is there, the only, and you all look at each other, you already know who that couple yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, we already, I, um. What do you do for those couples who are just, mm. You Stop. pray for them. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I I just had a. And after them. that, what's next? <laughs> yeah, I I had a I had a session. Um, Cause somebody is here who's who's almost there, and, I, and that's why I'm not being facetious when I, I'm not, but I'm being real with you all. Yes, yes, yes absolutely, absolutely. I, absolutely. Somebody is, somebody's at that point. They've gone to several. I've been down that road myself, going to several, 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 and it's just not sticking. So what do you do? What do you do for them? And then what do you do for yourself to help mm. them get unstuck? Yeah, so I, I think it's, uh, well, what we call ourselves uh, relationship uh, developers or re yeah. relationship we develop, we, we co-create or help you co-create your relationship. There is some couples, there was a couple this, this week that things were getting very heated and mm. we were doing some mentoring and at the end I did two things. I... I ask myself, hey, you know, there's nothing in the sense of I'm not responsible for the decision they're going to make because I, I, I always work with my heart. I give it all I got. And the second thing is to pray for them, really pray for them. And I have seen miracles happen where mm -hmm. things kind of turn around and, and, and you see them having a better conversation. If they don't turn around the way they need to, I also, I also pray, say, you know what, God, they made the right decision because mm -hmm. if they get together, they can literally, they can really damage their lives. They can damage the kids that they might have. They might damage some family members. So sometimes it's a blessing that things don't work out. Mm -hmm. And I know it hurts, but at the same time, believe me, it's going to hurt 20 times more afterwards. And that goes back to what Christina said. I remember that day that I, I was in Boston and I called her and said, do you still love me? Because I knew my father used to say, if a woman doesn't love you, I don't care what you do, man. I don't care if you win the lottery. I don't care what you do. It's not, you're not going to get, you're not mm. going to get true love from her unless she truly love you. And when I asked that question, I was like crossing my fingers because I'm like, I'm about to lose everything that I, work for once you say yes i'm like hey I'm, I'm i'm ready to jump I, i'm ready to do anything that the lord has asked me to do but i think if those couples they come to a conclusion where there is no love then i know it's going to be painful mm -hmm. but we pray for them and and i'm glad that they didn't they didn't make the decision to to get married because i think it goes back to not creating awareness while mm -hmm. we coming together mm -hmm. for the first for you know in the first place right yeah and i i also think you know it's really lamar it's like balancing this approach of you know sometimes it needs to get worse before it gets better to be honest like if you really mm. want to tackle or dive deep into what your challenges are in your relationship and there are a lot of courageous people out there i mean it's amazing what we've seen overcome um despite a whole variety of challenges. And I think it's 
you know, it's courageous to live your life outside of the world and have all these conquests and successes, but I personally think it's even more courageous to do it in your emotional life with the people that you love the most, right? And so for those folks, sometimes we have to just give them that hope of like, this is a process. It's going to be messy. Sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. You know, find your anchor. What's your self-coping mechanisms? What's your self-care? How can you individually connect? How can you collectively connect? How can you take space when you need it? Um, it's a healing process. And everyone has a different way of being able to discern if it's, you know, go or mm. stop. Um, but I, I try, we just try and also emulate that this is a very respectful process. And we also really always try and provide a space, play, a safe place for people to just be honest about wherever they're at with exactly. no shame and no blame. Exactly. And to me, that's like more than half the battle because so many people feel so much judgment on themselves first. Christine, those are some great, great examples. What are some things that you all do as a couple to keep your energy and your fire going? Because you're pouring into so many other people. You have two daughters who are in the space with you. You also are quarantined. I um, mean, you're able to move around. So walk me through some things that you all do to keep the spark going. And hopefully it will inspire some of my listeners that are out there. Well, um, Javi's very spontaneous, but a lot of times he's like, let's just go, let's go take off, you know? And so that is very, I'm not like that. I'm more of like a planner and he'll be like, let's just go. And I'm like, okay, where are we going? He's like, I don't know. Let's just do something. So we'll take a drive, you know, we'll go to the beach, even if it's for an hour. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, even if it's just a walk around our neighborhood, um, we need that space together because our children, like us, are extroverted, loud, and they interrupt. And they are always trying to get in. Our, you know, it's like, so we need to have that. Um, we also do individual prayer. Plan, like, we have our routines in the morning. Javi gets up there for me. He does his own meditation and prayer, and I do mine. And then we usually always have a cup of coffee um, every morning. And sometimes it's five minutes, sometimes it's 20, sometimes it's been, you know, if it's a, if it's a luxurious day, it's longer, but that grounds us. And if things happen and we don't have that individual contact, like even over a couple, two couple days, we start feeling it. Yeah. Definitely. There's and, tension. Uh, yes. And, and another thing that I, that I do that I think is, is very uh, helpful is, is really check in with each other. How do you feel today? Mm. And, and have a conversation. And uh, I reach out to Christina and say, you know what? I'm, I'm feeling angry today uh, because this happened. And, and just have a conversation because I know Christina is not judging me. She's listening. But it's good for me to download and, and, and share that I'm feeling angry. I'm feeling frustrated. Uh, I'm feeling this way, and she will do the same thing. So we kind of check in with each other. Uh, that's a good. That's a good point, Javier. What What outside of how are you doing? What are some other questions you think we should we should ask our partners as we're checking in throughout the day? I think one of the things is, um, especially right now, is do you do you want some time alone? Do you need mm. to take some space? Like, I just want to open that up because we are all like you know, in each other's space all the time. I mean, I know things disrupt it, but to me, virtual space is still physical proximity. Like even though we're doing different things virtually, we're still under the same roof. So I'm constantly encouraging him or trying to check in with him around, you know, do you need to go, see, or even do you need to see your friends? Do you need to go with your running buddies? Like, do you need to take a run? You know, and he'll be like, you're right, I'm gonna go do that. And that's it. But yeah, to I, encourage those self-care behaviors, those questions that point to like what you know your partner gets life from. Yeah, yeah, I know. With a lot of the work that I do lately, Javier and, and Christine is around around equity. My conversation around race, culture, and class. And one of my buddies who's from Austria, no, he's 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 from Africa, but he lived in Austria. And I remember he came here. He's working at Hopkins. I both I worked at Hopkins. He was doing some work in the music department. And he says, "Why do people in America always ask rhetorical questions like?" How are you? How, how are you today? When they don't really want to know the answer, and I was like, yeah. you know what? That is so. Because I remember a friend of mine asked this guy at the, at the gas station one day, like, how are you? And he just I, he started cursing. My day is, blah, 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 blah. and I said, you shouldn't have asked. You shouldn't have answered that question because you you didn't even really know want to know the answer, and you don't have a comeback for him. What are you gonna say to him? So I think asking some different questions 
Yeah. Uh, my, my good friend and mentor, Pedro Nogueiro, says when you ask different questions, you get different answers. And I think outside of just saying, how are you doing? I think, Christina, there was some of, some of the good questions that you threw out there that we need to check in. So now I know you all have this amazing book, uh, Boundless Love, Healing Your Marriage Before It Begins, um, which is an interesting title because what it says is you need to do the work up front. That's what I'm reading before you start to walk down the aisle. What are some things that I need to do up front before I walk down the aisle? And then how can our listeners get in contact, get a copy of your book and how can they get in contact with you? So let's talk about the book. Okay. Well, I think the first, there's, so there's 12 chapters and we really take it step by step. And the structure of the book is each chapter has um, my point of view. And then also the second part of the chapter or vice versa has Javi's point of view. So you have a female male perspective throughout and they're very distinct, but on same themes. So mm -hmm. some of the themes are um, around self-discovery, similar to what we were talking about before, like knowing who you are, what you stand for, what you believe. Um, also getting right with God or whatever your creator is. What is your belief system? Do you have one around faith? Is that important to you? How do you want to cultivate that? A big one too, especially before marriage, but it gets tested throughout is boundaries. What relationship boundaries, not just like with family or community or job or that kind of, but also with one another and with self, like, where do I begin? You end, like, how can we, you know, empower each other, not enable each other, those kind of things. So the boundaries piece. We also do, Javi's favorite topic is finances. So he, there's a whole section because we've been down the money train. Like that has been a huge. Um, and that's one of the reasons that many people, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, typically yes. finances is what, what breaks a couple up. Oh, big, yes. Big, yes. big one. And, and, yes. and that comes back from culture. When I say culture, I'm not saying like Latin culture versus African culture or Irish culture. I'm saying a culture within your family, within no, your that's family, right. how your family handles finance. So I'm glad that you all have a chapter on finances. Speaking of that, you know, what are some of the, what are some of the big reasons, if there's maybe, a, I don't want to say a big three because I don't like to give numbers, but what are some of the big reasons that you're seeing couples separating and going mm -hmm. their separate ways? I think what I do think financial stress is huge. Um, but I also within that Lamar, I think it's also like gender role, like mm. tension. Mm. And so right now, you know, we have a lot of nieces and nephews, um, who are either engaged or just married or like on that road. And we can see it a lot. Ironically, the, the young men sometimes have a harder time or struggling around their career where the females um, are just more stable economically, et cetera. So that creates a very interesting, right? Like on, it, it upends some like social norms or gender stereotypes. So I think that's also part of it. We see that maybe it's like, well, I'm not going to propose to you or I, I don't want to get married because millennials are delaying marriage or they're not getting married at all. And statistically speaking. And so they're like, well, I'm not settled, which means like I'm not economically secure. Yeah. So I think that is a definitely up and coming thing. But I also think like we see a lot because we are faith based of one believer with a non believer. Mm -hmm. And that is very challenging. You know, it's interesting because I hear people say this all the time, but when we get married, he's gonna start going to church with me or when That's right. oh, yeah. oh. he's gonna start going to the mosque with me. If that person and not saying it it couldn't happen. But I think it does. So I'm so glad you bring, you brought up that point. My last question for you, and I wasn't going to bring, you just brought this to my attention. Let's talk about your own family. D does your family members come to you? Do your family members come to you? <laughs> no, they avoid us. They avoid us. <laughs> <laughs> like the plague and like COVID, huh? So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so to, they, they, they try to stay away from you when it comes to... Um, it's so funny. It, it is. It is funny that I. We're I, just family to them. We're, we're just family know? to them, and I think I think what happens is for us, uh, we never thought when we got married that we were going to go on this journey, and suddenly we're going through this journey, and a lot of people say, "What you're going to write a book, and like, you're going to why do you want to write a book, and you're going to write, you're going to open up a nonprofit ministry, and you're going to do this," and we're like, "Yeah," and they're like, "Yeah, yeah, sure," and as soon as we start mm -hmm. doing it, they're like. So it, it's like, and, and I'm very uh, candy with my, my family, I think is you start flying in a higher altitude. And then for them, it's just they're, 
they're in their in their zone, so they don't relate to what you're going through. So uh, we do have some nieces and nephews that that, that come to us. They're interested in the work that we're doing. But my older brother, my older sister. So do speaking of older brother. You know, like, where am I? Where am I in the book? Where, yeah. Tell me my <laughs> they don't really. <laughs> so so is there a moment where you feel two things? Do has anybody in your family feel that you're judging their relationship? And has anybody on the other side felt like that they're judging towards you? Like they're looking at how you all behave and like, well, your marriage is not perfect. And why should I listen to you? And, and you're looking at somebody else's marriage in the family. Is there that banter going back and forth that you all have ever had within, within the I, I don't think it's so much of judgment. It's more of like, why would you want to, why would you want to air your dirty laundry? Like, why uh, would you want to put yourself? Yeah. Why would you want to tell people all that? Yeah. You yeah. know, or, um, probably so, because we want relationships to work out. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, absolutely. I, Thank you. yeah, that, that, yeah. So we, we needed to be very careful in yes. the book mm-hmm. in terms of, uh, from a legal perspective, because, you know, th- th- there can be some issues there. So we were very careful in that. Yeah. Because yeah, right, writing a book, we open. Yeah. When, when you're writing a book and you're including other people, like I wrote a book about, so I grew up in Chicago. I wrote a book about my friends. We call ourselves Chaos. And we were a group of African-American, Latino, and Caribbean kids, and all males of color. And we had all of our issues. And I rem- the book was really about my educational journey, traveling all over the country. But the backdrop were my friends, you know, the core of the book. Mm. And I remember having to have a conversation yeah. with one of my buddies about an issue around literacy in high school and his challenges. And it was a hard conversation. But I told him this, this story was bigger than him. It wasn't like I was yeah. trying to expose him or out him. But I knew that there was another athlete out there who was going through school and they were pushing him. And it was hard. Mm-hmm. Let me just tell you, Javier and Christine, it was really, really hard. I had to call another one of my buddies. And I said, I'm going to do it. I said, I'm going to do it. If our friendship breaks apart, then it wasn't that strong. But it's really about these other kids that are out here. So how can our listeners get in contact with you? And how can they get a copy of this amazing book? So all you got to do is go to Amazon. It's Boundless Love, Healing Your Marriage Before It Begins. And then we have a website chock full of all of our upcoming events. It's boundlesslove.us. Easy oh. peasy. Let me tell you couples out there, we are all struggling. We're going through something. And with this pandemic, we want you to be in a healthy relationship. So we want mm-hmm. you to check them out. Javier and Christina, before you leave the show, my favorite part of the show is called the Super Bomb Questions. It's an opportunity for our listeners to get a chance to know a little bit more about you. And you can go in any direction when I throw the question out. Javi, you can go first. Christina, it really doesn't matter. You guys ready? All right. All right, here we go. And and you want to respond as quickly as possible. What's your favorite word? Love. Home. (laughs) (laughs) What's What's your favorite quote or Bible verse? Be still. Um, all things are possible with him. What's your superpower? I'm courageous. Honest. What's your animal spirit? <sighs> Lioness. I think I'm a horse. <laughs> Caballo. What brings you to tears of joy? When my children succeed. Hmm. Uh, same here. I think, I think our, our daughters, the way they're growing. Yeah. They're amazing, amazing young ladies. Well, they got amazing parents. What brings, Thank you you. To, what brings you to tears of sorrow? When I see my parents in pain. Yeah. Suffering in my family. What do you both wish you had more time to do? Read. <laughs> Run. <laughs> Run. <laughs> What deceased person would you most like to meet or get advice from? Abraham Lincoln. Jesus. Mm. What is the one, what is one of the best or worth, best or most worthwhile investment you've ever made? Married a Spaniard. (laughs) (laughs) Whoopa. I guess guess marrying a lady from Michigan. (laughs) Detroit City. That's right. Yeah. Detroit City. (laughs) So if you were in the Mrs. America or Mr. America talent competition, what would your talent be? Mm, I think poet, reading poetry, my poetry, 
I I'm definitely a three course uh, oh, chef dinner. Yes. I can I can definitely yes. do fine, fine dining for you. You can burn in the kitchen. Oh, <laughs> yeah. his paella is dope. By paella. Oh, I love oh. paella. Oh, I love paella. Well, listen. Christine and Javier, I love the love that you're spreading across the airways and across the universe. We need more couples like you all to keep us together. I want to thank you for joining me today and taking some time out of your busy schedule. I'm telling you all, go check them out. Pick up their books. Send my love to your daughters. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. Mom. Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you. God bless. And I also want to thank my amazing engineer, my Haitian brother, Alexander Blanc, my super duper producer, Nicole Klimpaka, Supremacy for our theme music, and all of you for listening. We cannot do it without you. Make sure you subscribe. Go check out our new YouTube channel. We have all the videos that are there. Leave a comment. Stop being stingy. Share me with all of your friends. If you want to know more about me, you can go to Dr. DrLDS.com. And as always, believe something wonderful is about to happen. And that some people miss the message because they're too busy looking for the mess. Thanks for tuning in and do something for someone other than yourself today. You've been listening to Sound Bombing. Peace.